In this segment, we're going to talk about the independence assumptions underlying PCFGs and why these maybe aren't so good. So we set up this idea of uh, building a PCFG by estimating a grammar from a tree bank and then parsing with that grammar. If you do this, it turns out you actually build a pretty bad parser. And the reason is because context-free grammars are too context-free. So what we're showing here is the distribution of rewrite rules for all NPs on the left. And so 11% of the time they rewrite as a noun phrase followed by a prepositional phrase. Um, for example, uh, the cake with icing. That would be a, a kind of big noun phrase that rewrites in this way. 9% um, is a determiner and a noun, like the cake. Uh, and 6% of the time is a personal pronoun. But when an NP is occurring under the S symbol, meaning that it's probably the subject of a verb in a sentence, it's 21% of the time going to be a personal pronoun, but the under a verb phrase, that's only true 4% of the time. So the, this represents the fact that language is really not context-free. These NPs in different positions are like should be handled differently. So in order to build better grammars, we're going to have to think about how to take our basic PCFG and make it a little bit stronger. And so the way we can capture this is through an idea called what's called vertical Markovization. So this is the basic PCFG. This is the basic uh, tree over a sentence that we're going to read our uh, read our parser off of. But what we could do is we can transform this tree. So what I've done here is I've added a caret after each symbol and then added the identity of the parent symbol after that caret. So this is a the fairly simple pre-processing step that we can apply to our tree bank. We can just go through every tree that you give me and apply this transformation. And now if we read a grammar off, we actually have two different well, we have many different types of noun phrases. But in particular, here we have this NP caret S noun phrase that is going to be able to capture the distribution of what goes on in noun phrases that occur under the S symbol. And similarly, VP caret S can capture the, the distribution of verb phrases under the S symbol. So why is this a good idea? Well, it allows us to greatly increase the size of our grammar, which is maybe a little bit of a problem from a statistical efficiency standpoint, but it enables us to model these distributions in a much more fine-grained way. There's another type of transformation we can do that deals with binarization. So first I'm going to show you another way of doing so-called lossless binarization. So before we had this idea of underneath the verb phrase, uh, right here, we basically encoded this like super symbol uh, with like everything listed out here. Now what we're doing is we're only generating the uh, the yield bit by bit, and we're not doing it all in one go. But this is actually going to be equivalent to the uh, original way of doing lossless binarization because of the chain rule of probability. So we can decompose this rewrite of this complicated uh, VP rule into a bunch of atomic steps. And we're abusing notation a little bit here, but basically, you know, what this represents is that the probability of uh, a kind of big complicated event can be written as the probability of, you know, the first step and then the second step conditioned on the first, the third step conditioned on the first two, et cetera. And that's what this, this different grammar transformation is giving us. All right, so this enables us to uh, think about a new way of uh, transforming trees when we're doing binarization called horizontal Markovization. So we have a kind of slider here, which controls the amount of information that we remember in the grammar here. So uh, if we talked about this idea of lossy binarization, just replacing everything with a VP symbol here, and that we call H equals zero. And that's going to be the kind of most compact grammar, but also the weakest grammar in terms of modeling what actually goes on at these intermediate stages of generation. H equals 1, what we're going to do is, rather than remember all of the uh, symbols inside this bracketed thing, we're only going to remember the previous one. 
And so if we look down at the second, uh, the second symbol, that means we forget about the fact that we, had, we came from VBZ. All right, and then h equals two, we remember two symbols of context. Um, and so you, you've got a kind of trade-off here that you can apply. Um, now, there's, again, there's a fair number of implementation details for this in practice. In practice, you always remember the, the, the head tag, meaning the tag that's a verb in this case. So you, you would actually always remember the VBZ in this case. Uh, but this gives you a way of sort of like vertical Markovization controlled the amount of context we paid attention to. Here, we're also paying it, con you know, controlling the amount of context we pay attention to, except this time when dealing with these high arity rules. All right, so what we do is we typically, when pre-processing a tree bank, we first apply vertical Markovization, like what's on the left here, and then apply this horizontal Markovization. And so we can form some fairly complicated structures and symbols in this way, but we're only gonna see a kind of small fraction of the total number of possible symbols. So even though this kind of theoretically is like an exponential blow up in the size of our grammar, um, in practice, it blows it up by a good factor, but it doesn't get too out of control. So this was investigated by Klein and Manning back in 2003, and what they found was that if, you know, you can take a basic parser, um, v equals one, h equals zero, which can parse to uh, a kind of accuracy of around 70%, um, and you can increase that to almost 80% just through these Markovization tricks. So this is pretty cool because uh, it reflects basically needing to, uh, or it reflects, it reflects a fairly simple transformation that can improve our performance pretty substantially. And so now we're gonna contrast that with some more complicated approaches that uh, improve performance earlier, but that can kind of underscore why these simple transformations are sort of nice. So the dominant paradigm uh, at the time that Klein and Manning were doing this back in 2003 was what's called lexicalization. Lexicalization captures a different idea and one that's gonna be fairly important but uh, is gonna be very hard to implement, at least in constituency grammar. So we have two examples here of different analyses for dogs and houses and cats. So on the left side here, we are saying that there are dogs and houses and there are also cats. And on the right side, we are saying that there are dogs that are in both houses and cats, which doesn't make sense. The problem is that even doing all this parent annotation stuff, actually both of these trees still look the same because the rules applied are exactly the same in both cases. The difference ends up being the words. And so in order to understand the fact that dogs and cats is a more likely set of things to conjoin than houses and cats, we really need to be looking at the words. And so what lexicalized parsers do is they annotate each grammar symbol now, not with something about its context, like you know things about its kind of siblings or parents like we were seeing before, but instead with a so-called head word. Now the head word is the most important word of that constituent. And so the kind of simple heuristic to think about is like for a verb phrase, the head is a verb. For a noun phrase, the head is a noun. For a sentence, the head is also a verb because the idea is that a sentence is fundamentally describing some kind of event. Um, and of course, there are sentences that don't contain verbs. Um, you know, we're not gonna go into that. All right, so what we could do is we can, uh, write down a set of rules that identify these, uh, these, these uh, heads. For example, in a noun phrase, the last word or the last word before a preposition is typically the head. So we can extract these head words and kind of annotate our grammar with them, right? So now, okay, can't we just take our PCFG approach, read a grammar off of our tree bank and parse with it? So the answer is no, because the grammar is now way too large to deal with. And the fact that we've done this lexicalization means that we need a whole bunch more tricks in order to deal with it. So in the late 90s, uh, Mike Collins and Eugene Charniak built parsers that were parsing to almost 90 F1 on uh, the standard English pen tree bank with this kind of technique. 
Um, and so this evaluation metric looks at basically how many nodes in the parse tree you get right. Uh, and so if we think about getting, you know, almost you know, roughly, we'll say 90% of the nodes correct, that's pretty good. Uh, and it, it, was, it was true before uh, a lot of these kind of fancier machine learning techniques had been developed, but these parsers are incredibly hard to build. So what we're going to talk about going forward is a way of capturing some of the same idea as lexicalized parsers, but much more simply. And that's why we're going to turn to dependency as a formalism. Um, but even in constituency, there's sort of tricks for uh, you know, incorporating the words into the parsing process using discriminative parsers. And so we'll come back to those a little bit later as well. So what we've seen here is if you want to make a PCFG work, you need to do some kind of refinement on it. Uh, and so we've seen a couple different ways to do that. And then we'll talk about uh, kind of what, what actual parsers look like in a few segments. That's it for this one.